Hi, everyone, and welcome back to IS Podcast, ISV's show for schools and the wider community. I'm Shane Green. On today's episode, Natalie Mutafis talks with Luca Parry about the importance of social emotional learning, or SEL, in educating our children. But first, Mike Broadstock talks with Resource Smart Secondary School Teacher of the Year, Claire Tui, about the sustainability programs at Beacon Hills College and why they are so important for students. As Head of Citizenship and Service, Claire Tui promoted social and environmental justice at Beacon Hills College for a number of years. This year, her efforts developing the Beacon of Hope Community Garden were recognised when Sustainability Victoria named her the Resource Smart Secondary School Teacher of the Year for 2022. Today, we have the pleasure of talking with Claire about her work and why sustainability education is so important. Welcome to IS Podcast, Claire. Thanks, Mike, and thank you for having me. It's lovely to be able to have the conversation with you and share our successes. So tell us about Beacon Hills College and the Beacon of Hope Community Garden. I'm really very proud to be part of the Beacon Hills College community. It was a a school that was founded in 1982, so 40 years ago. And when we look at a contemporary school as we are now, with a vision and a mission and values, we can actually see the links between what our founding father's vision was and what we're doing today. And that's particularly in relation to developing a school truly for the local community where our students can learn and understand how they can be shining lights in their own futures, but also the futures of others. The values of respect, compassion and integrity, along with the mission of giving students every opportunity that we can to let their light shine and be beacons of hope in the lives of others, guides everything that we do at the college. And so our recently retired headmaster, Tony Schumach, had a very clearly defined vision of creating a community garden at Beacon Hills College that would support and create a sense of inclusion for all members of our local community. The growth of the Southeastern Corridor has been amazing, but we also see many people living in isolation and often with very little purpose. So, Mike, the story started way back in March 2020. I walked into Tony's office and said to him, there's an urgent need to fast track our community garden. I'd just attended a meeting at the Cardinia Shire where a very bleak picture had been painted of the looming challenge of food insecurity in our local area. And of course, March 2020 was the beginning of COVID. And at that point, we had absolutely no idea of where COVID would take us and the impact that it might have on our community. So in some ways, it was a bit of a risk, me marching into the headmaster's office saying, we've got to do this right now, Tony. Tony and the college head of business and strategy, David Young, put total trust in my proposal. And so the initiative and the project started straight away. I worked really closely with our property manager, Matt Davis, and college maintenance team member, Roger Churchill. And we invited seven year 10 students to make up our project team. The students were really happy to volunteer their time and we were also joined by three college alumni. So really the project team was made up entirely of Beacon Hills College community members, which was wonderful. So we started a program of building garden beds, designing and integrating water systems, planning, nurturing and finally harvesting. And after 12 months, we had the most amazing outcome of 90 crates of fresh vegetables that were donated to the local Salvation Army group and Frankie's Community Kitchen in Warrigal, which is a food security organisation. I retired at the end of 2021, but the garden continues going from strength to strength. Under the leadership of Roger, our college gardener, senior school teacher Jeff Porter and the same group of students. And I'm now really determined that the award should be seen as a college award. It's not about me. It was truly because of the team and all that we were able to achieve with the community garden that this award did come to Beacon Hills College. So I'm very proud of that. And it's not the only way Beacon Hills supports sustainability, is no. it? You've got other programs at the Absolutely. school. Absolutely. We believe that modelling the right thing and caring for others in our world is a really important learning opportunity for all of our students and their families. 
So, yeah, I mean, the community garden is just one of many programs at the college. And one of the driving forces behind sustainability has been our college head of business and strategy, Mr. David Young. The passion, commitment and modelling, everything that he takes on personally and professionally. It's amazing what he's done. All new buildings and constructions are designed to incorporate state-of-the-art sustainability practices and facilities. Solar panels are on most buildings at the college. And we're, again, very humbled to be recognised as the second largest solar panelled or powered school in the state. With more than half of the college electricity produced by our own solar panel program. David's goal is that by 2025 that we will be completely off grid for all of our electricity, which is amazing. And so I was talking to David last week and since 2014, uh, the college has saved about $1.1 million in energy costs wow. because of his initiatives which is amazing. Water also is very much part of our sustainable program. And again, we've cut our water usage in half since 2020, and that's through recycling as well as water tanks. Paper usage, whether it be photocopying, we monitor that really carefully. Whether it be in bathrooms where dispensers are set at only two sheets of paper per person per time. Grounds and gardens, we have Indigenous gardens, we have food gardens. Landscaping plants and gardens require very little, if any, um, if any water, and creation of lots of green spaces. Waste, we have a three-bin system where we look at organic, commingle, uh, paper and landfill. So that's the, right across the college. The college also, to, to our community, offers recycling programs for clothing, small electrical goods, batteries, metals, soft plastics. And I think one of the really exciting things at the moment, we've just recently finished the construction of a community performing arts centre in Berwick. An old building had to be demolished to make way for the new one and 96% of the materials demolished were able to be recycled in the wow. new building or sold on to other organisations. I, I think that's just the most amazing opportunity um, that we've taken. Our Solar Buddy program is about educating our children about energy poverty, particularly in developing countries. So countries like East Timor, Bangladesh, who in the more remote areas have absolutely no electricity. So we make these little solar-powered, um, they're like little torches, and we give those to children who are at school in those remote areas. They can take those little solar buddies home, do their homework at home after dark, after the sun goes in. So who makes them, sorry, Claire, the students? Yes, we make them. So there's an organisation in Brisbane who produces kits and then the kits are sent to us and then we make, we construct the solar buddies and then they're sent to these communities in um, either, or there are many countries, but the ones that we focus on are mostly East Timor and Bangladesh. So for our children to know that they're making a really big difference is, is very, very important and a very important part of their education at Beacon Hills. More broadly, why is sustainability education important? Yeah, lots of answers to that question, Mark. The research out there tells us that many young people are really concerned about their futures and particularly about sustainability, climate change, the environment. So part of our job is to educate our community, and I mean here not just students but families, on strategies that will help minimise the damage to our global environment. And we believe the more conversations that we can have, the better in empowering our young people to know that they can make a difference, that every single person can make a big difference. So modelling sustainability practices that we've put into place here at Beacon Hills hopefully will be something that many of our students will be able to take on in the rest of their lives. It seems important to me that you've got all the programs that you run yourself. You're not just talking the talk, you're walking the talk as well. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a really important one. So, I mean, everything is visible. We want our families to know that everything can either be recycled or repurposed. So that, that's why I think that, you know, the, the importance of sustainability in education is so, so crucial at this particular time. And you're saying that students are worried about where the planet's headed? 
They are, yeah. So ha- how do they engage with the sort of programs? With the programs? Talking? There are several aspects, Mark. Probably one of the most important is curriculum integration. So we look at ways that we can integrate sustainability units of work right from our early learning centre, Little Beacons, right through to year 12. What sort of ways? Can you give me some examples? Well, I can. Little Beacons, for example, early learning centre. The children in one of the the rooms, the baby's room at Little Beacons, came home with gifts for their dads for Father's Day. They were living plants, which I thought was wonderful. So every dad received a living plant. The children, the little children are taken to see the college vegetable gardens. They go and they look at the worm farm so that they have a very clear understanding right from the start where Beacon Hill stands. Uh, Year one, uh, they do a great unit called, I think it's called Our Actions Influence That Changes Our Environment. And so we, we really build a sense of awareness of our changing planet and we encourage the children to see themselves as being an essential part of the solution to the global problems. They visit Phillip Island and they learn about the impact that humans can have on the environment, and in particular on animals such as shearwaters, koalas and penguins. So they sort of almost become ocean guardians simply by taking actions such as picking up litter, not using straws in drinks and using recyclable drink bottles. Um, Year five, our sustainability programs are all documented. Data is tracked on how we're using electricity, water, etc., And that comes out as a publication called Our Green Report. So the children in Year 5 for their numeracy units use real-time data from that program and they learn to understand many of the aspects of numeracy that are part of the curriculum. I could go on, Mike. (laughs) That's really embedded in the curriculum. It is, Mm. absolutely. I remember when I was young, you you talked about your three bins. The recycling bin was new. I mean, this is a long time yes. ago now, but, you know, it was it was new. And I remember our teachers talking about it in school and going home and trying to do the right thing myself yes. in making sure that we were putting the things in the right bins and so on. Do students, having done this work at school, how, how does it translate into their home lives? It's interesting and it is all mostly anecdotal evidence. But when you talk to students and you ask them what kinds of sustainability practices they have at home, do you know they certainly comply with local council recycling programs. Some of them have got worm farms. Many of them have got vegetable gardens. Many houses have got solar panels. So what we're seeing is that a duplication almost of what's happening at school happening in many of our homes, which is really, really pleasing. Something you said, Beacon Hills doesn't want to be the best school in the world, but the best school for for the world. world. Yes, yes. And so we want our community to go out and make our world a better place because of what they have learned at school, whether it be from early learning centre right through to year 12. Uh, it's far more than just, you know, what grade did you get? But it's about how can you be the most amazing steward that is going to make our world a better place? We also, you know, aim to have our students to look outward rather than looking inward and also recognising how much power they've got as an individual to make a really big difference on a global scale. It's been really lovely having you on Ice Podcast, Claire, and hearing about all the work Beacon Hills has been doing and changes we've been making in the community. Thanks for joining us. You're listening to IS Podcast. Luca Parry is an educator, strategist and entrepreneur working with schools, systems and organisations as they adapt for the future. His particular focus is social emotional learning or SEL. As Luca explains, the connection of the mind and the heart plays such an important part in education, creating flourishing lives and connecting communities. He talks with Natalie Mutafis. So welcome to IS Podcast, Luca. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, we've asked you to join us today to talk about a topic that you are very well known for, and that's SEL or social emotional learning. Now, I say you're well known because you are the founder and CEO of The Learning Future and a founding executive of Karanga, the Global Alliance for Social, Emotional Learning and Life Skills. Mm -hmm. So this is clearly an area you are very passionate about. It's very (laughs) close to my heart. And that's a terrible gag, but it's so true. I mean, 
because it, it's it's close to everybody's hearts. You know, this is really the connection of the mind and the heart. I mean, you know, we are deep, deep down, we are social, emotional, cognitive beings. And so it's the integration of those parts of ourselves that I think is what can create flourishing lives, true agency, socially connected communities. So yeah, it's it's a big focus of my work because when I think about the future of learning, I really do believe it's the bringing together, the remembering of these different parts that we've kind of in our industrialized world and including industrialized education systems divided and elevated particular components to be seen as success solely when I think most of us know deep down we're multidimensional. So yeah, it's definitely something I focus a lot on and I really have just such a privileged position to be able to work alongside schools and educators. I'm a physiotherapist, if I use a metaphor, you know, and I work with athletes. The athletes are educators, they're leaders, both within and outside education. My role is to kind of be on the side and to help guide somewhat, to illuminate, to discover, and then ultimately to redesign and remake experiences, environments, and, and ecosystems. So ISV is also really invested in SEL. So we've got programs such as Wayfinder and Future Horizons offered through our Innovation Design Lab for Learning. And you have actually been involved in the Future Horizons course. Could you share a little about your involvement in this? I've loved doing this work this year in 2022 with a number of different schools. Because again, I think I'm an aspiring, I'm an aspiring everything, let's be honest, <laughs> Nat. You know, for me, it's what might the future look like? And then, of course, what's our preferred future? And the more that I think about those spaces, well, it's about remembering our humanness. It's about the elevation of particular components. Clearly, we have multiple pandemics and epidemics going on simultaneously. Some are about COVID still. We're not po completely post-COVID yet. But then we also have the mental health epidemic. And then we also have an ecological crisis that's also unfolding around us. And so when we look forward, we really have to think about you know, how do we support schools to, to focus more on the social and emotional dimensions of learning and being? Because when you do that, ultimately, you also connect to the cognitive parts of learning and being. So, you know, to be great thinkers, we actually have to also be good feelers. And so this idea that we can focus through curriculum, through pedagogy, through organizational cultures in schools... You know, and really, how do we all be well? And I guess the one other thing I'd say around perhaps my discoveries so far in this work is it's not enough just to say student well-being and to focus on students because it's an ecosystem. Everything is multifactorial. Everything impacts. So if you've got a teacher that's working incredibly hard and is of service but they are burning out, and the data is really clear on this, by the way, <laughs> in terms of how, how teachers are really under pressure at the moment and we need some system shift so that they can be well also. So it really is this idea of, you know, how do we create human well-being at a school system and how do we create almost ecological well-being at a planetary level as well, which is the part that we need to also consider for our pieces. So it's been great to work with these schools, you know, across three kind of really deep dive sessions, all online, of course, which is now what we're all very familiar with. But, you know, really just discover and then also to design, you know, what might the future for each of these schools be, knowing that everybody's in a different particular context and context is queen. Yeah, I've really, it's been a delight to work with, with some of the schools in this community. So what role do you believe SEL have in our schools? Should it be at the centre of the school design or curriculum design? Yes. <laughs> it's, a <very> quick, <laughs> it's a very quick answer. Uh, yes and, right? Because yeah. what, what we note around social and emotional learning, it's, it's not to say that academics don't matter. We're far from it. The Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning called CASEL, which is one of the, the big kind of influences in this space and in fact have, have done more than any other organization to, I would say, elevate and articulate and research the role of SEL. You know, they actually have academic in their name. So the idea here is that it's not that we need to like put in now a program on Wednesdays so that we can be more academically focused. It's that, that there's a recognition, and, and this is coming from all over the place. There's a recognition from industry, from think tanks, from places like the OECD, the World Economic Forum, Institute for the Future, the World Bank, UNESCO. I mean, all of these organizations that are kind of the global level are now articulating that we need a different kind 
of education. It's not more of something, but a different shift in quality. And so when we can focus on social emotional learning and we place it at the center of our schools, alongside, of course, rigor and academics, well, then what we see is a raise actually in overall happiness and overall performance and overall well-being. And for me, that seems to be the goal is as I often reflect, what's the point of having someone that gets a 99.9 ATAR but feels desperately isolated socially and is struggling with their emotions? I mean, this idea that that's not setting anyone up to be successful in the future world. You look at industry and you look at all the predictions around the future of work, it's social and emotional skills that top the, the rankings in terms of what the future skill sets might be alongside technical skills, which of course can be learned and will need to be relearned over the course of our lifetimes. So I really think social emotional learning, there's some interesting innovations happening all over the world where we're seeing SEL and math curricula in Canada becoming completely integrated, for example. And, and we're seeing this idea that it's not just about a program, it's about practice and philosophy as well. And that's really how a school, and like frankly, any organization should be thinking um, and uh, we can extend this conversation as well, Natalie, to all organizations. Why? Because they are human systems. And then the question is, well, what does it mean to be human? Well, it means to have this multidimensionality, be able to kind of think well, feel well, connect well, you know, be physically fit. All these different things contribute to how well, if we are thriving and if we are not. And I think there's a big theme here, not least of all, because Australia is going to have a well-being budget launched by this new federal government as well. And again, so there's something in the zeitgeist that we should pick up, you know, at the big picture level. And then, of course, what's the practical things that we can do in schools? And that's really what we focused on in the Future Horizons course as well. Uh, you know, how does curriculum shift? And it's not about doing more. Schools can't do more. Educators are working so incredibly hard of service and holding so much. So the question must be, how do we do differently? How do we actually unlock the real potential the real passion that exists within the human beings in these systems. And so they don't become what Dylan Willem used to often, often quotes, which is schools are places where young people go to watch adults work really hard. And that is such a powerful <laughs> reflection from Dylan. And he's Isn't a brilliant it? thinker, you know, as opposed to places where this is the place where we all go to discover together, to be agents, to try to think about our role as global citizens. And then of course, that's the elevation of, agency, true decision-making and co-design, instead of saying, we do student voice, which is we will consult our students about a decision and then we may or may not listen to them, you know, and I'm being slightly provocative, but you know, that it's actually moving beyond student voice through student choice towards true agency. And when we start talking about that, then we get kind of, we get some really interesting possibilities emerge. So do you have young people sitting on all the recruitment panels? For all your staff? Do you have young people at the board level? Do you have a co-principal that's actually a graduate from the previous year, year 13, and they work alongside, you know, being a kind of student? All these possibilities unlock, I think, when we shift you know, our idea of what school needs to be and we kind of hold open what school could be. So you mentioned before Canada. Where do you think Australia should be looking for inspiration and guidance in this? Like, is it more, you know, we need to look within Australia and how we're doing it and how it will suit us and that that will change from school to school or state to state or different areas or do we look internationally like pop it into Google SEL and so much comes up over so I many know. different topics like it's just insane so where do you start where do you stop <laughs> well I would that's a great question and I, I, I suppose Natalie my reflection is we should start by looking at ourselves you know we should start by finding out where are we right now what do we believe what's our vision and our mission at a school level and then also how lived out is that or are we still riddled by a hidden grammar that even though we say it's about whole person development we still elevate academics above everything else or we're still it's about ATAR results I mean ATAR is a really great example on this I suppose because Australia is one of only a few a handful of countries that that, that really rank students after 13 years of education by giving them a score. It's almost like you can line up all the young people from one side to the other, you know, and I feel like that's such a disservice. And there's some wonderful work that we've been doing at Learning Creates Australia, which is about how do you, how do you shift the recognition system? How do you go beyond the ATAR era? Because we're going to go beyond it. There's no question. But how do you do that in a coherent way where there's trust and equity baked into it? This idea that talent is universal, but opportunity is not. How do we, 
how do you have young people leaving school where they have a compass to be able to direct and navigate their way forward in this lifetime? That's a really deep question. More practically, when you think about well, where should we look? Well, we should probably do what we often ought to, which is do a kind of lit review and say, well, actually, what does the literature say works? What's the horizon? What's the ecosystem scan? Clearly looking at places like Castle, who have been the, the main proponents, I would say, of this work globally for some time around their, their model, their ecological social emotional learning model, which has five main constructs. You know, looking at a lot of their work, I think is great, but it's also been nested within the US ecosystem. So we've got to be cautious that we don't just say, oh, we're going to adopt this, can't blush. No, no, we have Mm. a unique quality here to Australia, but certainly to every single school community. Context is queen and we should always recognize that. You know, this what works question, we've got to be slightly cautious with that because it's, it's really like what might work. We don't really know if it's tested in one place, but this focus of scalability, I think is slightly challenging. So there's, there's some really good conceptual grounding I think we can talk to around social emotional learning. And it clearly, in my view, is one of the main vehicles to enable well-being to exist. It focuses on self-awareness <laughs> and self-regulation. And both of those things, like who are we? And then how do I regulate my emotional state? Which in my view is maybe the most important skill to develop is emotional regulation or self-regulation, which is also has social and cognitive componentry to it as well if you get down into the science. But then you also have, you know, social awareness. So, okay, what's my relationship with myself first? But what's my relationship with other people? And how do I have relationship skills? How do I actually interact with them? How do I solve problems? How can I debate? How can I disagree? And I tell you what, at societal levels, we probably need some more of those skills because we are not good at disagreeing, I would suggest, in our world. And then ultimately, it's ethical decision-making. And this is, these are the, the main five. They call them the big five in SEL work. It's ethical decision-making. Well, what's the right decision for us to make as an individual, as a team, as a group, as a company, as a city, as a, as a nation, or as, a, as a planetary species? And clearly, Mother Nature is uh, not all that thrilled with some of the decisions we've been making <laughs> through our market-based models, right? And so we're getting mm-hmm. to these tipping points where we've overshot the ecological limits of our planet. And so that's why I'm also a massive proponent for an you know, ecological model. We need to think about our impact on the planet and act powerfully, not out of horror, but out of a clear understanding that we need to think long term and instead of a two to three year planning cycle, which often schools operate on a three year strategic plan, companies sometimes it's, it's every quarter, like what's the quarterly reportings, you know, they may have a multi year strategy. But, you know, what's the 50-year goal here for us? How do you do long-term thinking? And this is why I'm so drawn to some of the futures literacy work because I think in education, teachers are futurists. They are people that visit the future and think, well, what are these young people that I'm serving need? And then they return to the present and do their best work, teaching curricula through engaging pedagogy and understanding how to assess and report so that young people are really empowered in their learning journey. So anyway, that's kind of my round the ground. It's a pretty big picture. But SEL, you know, it's a domain, right? It's a domain of knowledge and there's many wonderful academics across the world that are pushing this work. And the last thing I would just say here is, you know, people are paying attention at global levels and you just need to go to the OECD, which is maybe the most influential think tank in the world for many things, but particularly education. They run PISA and TIMS and a range of other international assessments. And they've just completed in 2020 the first ever international assessment on social and emotional skills. And so they are paying a lot of attention to this work because these are the skills for the future. Even if you have knowledge and you enter a workforce, it's really far better that you can collaborate, that you can regulate, that you can be aware of the social construct, you can be creative, you can collaboratively problem solve, and you're doing that as a good human being, you know, with a clear piece on character. This is who I choose to be and become. So the fact that there's all this kind of thing swirling at these kind of global levels, I think should give us fully permission to to step into the elevation of these constructs in the way that we teach, in the way that we assess. Really, it's ATAR plus. It's always been ATAR plus. The plus matters more than the ATAR. But I actually think we're going to go well beyond that. We have learner profiles and a far more personalized suite of ways of understanding and interconnecting industry, higher education and K-12 schooling into the future. Thanks for your time, Luca. And that's it for this episode of IS Podcast. 
We're going to leave you today with one of the winners from our recent student poetry competition, Ruby Wiggins from the Alice Miller School, who took out the year's 11-12 performance poetry category for her poem, The Thrill of the Theatre. Ruby embraced the competition's optional theme of belonging in what judges said was a clever and purposeful idea, explaining belonging through the lens of performance. One hour to go. I check my watch in anticipation. My heart thunders as I listen to the nervous chatter of my fellow crew. 45 minutes to go. I dash off to the bathroom to change. I exit the bathroom stall and look myself up and down, feeling the soft, floral, cottony dress flowing from my shoulders to my shins and see-through stockings on my legs with pink, patent leather lace-ups on my feet. I am her. She is me. 30 minutes to go. I dash over to the sink to start on my hair and makeup. I meticulously moisturise my face, cake on some loose powder to my cheeks and jawline and gently apply mascara to my eyelashes and pucker my lips with some clear lip balm. 25 minutes to go. I tug the hair tie out of my hair and feel my hair fall like silk to my shoulders. I brush out the tangles and pin the front strands back with two pink hair clips. 20 minutes to go. My stomach churns with anticipation as I rejoin my costumed cast with wide eyes, all squealing with the excitement of dressing like our characters. Our months of hard work has come down to this. 15 minutes to go, I peek a look at the stage to see people starting to file in, adding more layers to the already dense chatter of the room. Five minutes to go, the cast huddles together like a sports team, carefully strategizing their next move, bonding as a collective, as one, as all. The curtain lifts, the lights dim. My first song starts to roar with life from the band and the light falls on my face, and just like that, I'm out. Out of my body and into my character's mind, singing the meticulously pruned notes of my song and the movements and facial expressions that now are second nature. I sing my last note and hear the audience's applause that seems to reverberate off every surface and hums with an echo. One minute of the show to go. We walk in unison to centre stage to take our bows and sing our final song, our one and only song that everyone is in. We interlink arms and bow together before we know it, tears start flowing from happiness, from sadness, from relief as a whole. The audience leaps to their feet, hands clapping so fast that it's a blur and a sea of faces, awestruck, emotional, staring at us. The curtain lowers in front of us as the noise of the audience fades to a faint ringing in our ears. We gather into a tight group hug, the warmth of our bodies combining as a group, revelling of our achievements, of our tight friendships and our sense of togetherness. Something hard to come by. Hi's podcast is brought to you by Independent Schools Victoria. It's produced by Duncan McLean and presented by Natalie Mutafis, Michael Broadstock and me, Shane Green. Our podcast scene was composed and performed by Duncan. There are transcripts of our show with links to what we've discussed at podcast.iseducation.com.au. Please follow us wherever you get your favourite podcasts. And while you're there, we'd love it if you could rate and review the show so more people just like you can find us.